शन्नो विष्णु विष्णुक्रम नमो ब्रह्मणे नमस्ते वायो वायुमेव प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्मासी प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्म वदिष्या ऋत वदिष्या सत्यम वदिष्या तन्मावत तद्वक्तावत अवत मवत वक्ता ओ शाति 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 ओ सहना सहनौन सह वीकवाह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मद्विषा वह ओ शाति 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 ओ यंदो विश्व छंदोभ्योध्यमृतासंबूव स मेन्द्रो मेधया स्पृणत अमृत से देवधारणो भूयास शरीर मे विचर्षण जिह्वा मे मधुमत्तमा कर्णाभ्या भूरी विश्रुव ब्रह्मण कोशोसी मेधया पिहित श्रुत मे गोपा ओ शाति 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 ओ अहम वृक्ष से कीर्ति पृष्ठंगिरेव ऊर्धपवित्रो वाजिनी वमृतमस्मी द्रविण सवर्चस सुमेधा अमृतोक्षिशंकोर्वेदाचन ओ शाति 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 so the section of this mantra which we were discussing in our last class was this word urdhva pavitra which means that uh, i am pure from above we were discussing this word and uh, i was explaining that uh, what this idea of above this idea of up why up because up and down above and below these are relative terms since this mantra is deeply connected to vrikshasana i pointed this out also in my previous class this 
Urdhva Namaskara, this Namaskara above which we, which is in the final posture of Vrikshasana. <clears throat> it is interesting that there also, why Urdhva Namaskara? Why Namaskara above? Because ultimately, whether we do Namaskara in front or whether we do Paschima Namaskara, Namaskara in the back, the divine, that pure consciousness which is omnipresent, it, it's in all directions and therefore it doesn't matter. But why choosing particular directions? <clears throat> why above? So I was trying to explain that down, falling down, reaching down, we reach very easily without any effort. So that is down, below. And a state, because the path of yoga has stages. They are referred to as bhumika. Bhumika means levels or planes of awareness, planes of consciousness, levels of consciousness. The Buddha speaks of such bhumikas. Uh, several of the Buddhist yogic texts, specifically the Buddhist yogic texts, uh, which are dedicated to the subject of yoga, such as one of the one of the texts which was composed in the first or second century AD, Dashabhumika Yoga Shastra, the scripture which describes the ten bhumikas, the ten levels of yoga by Acharya Asanga, one of the great Mahayana Buddhist masters of India. Similarly, Patanjali speaks of, before he starts speaking about the eight-limbed path of yoga in the second chapter, one of the sutras that I usually leave out when we do uh, the introductory course on the yoga sutras in which we cover some of the most important sutras of the second chapter, and I leave out this sutra. It is about the seven bhumikas, the seven planes that are achieved by a yogi on an experiential level. So yoga, because it's a very systematic path, it creates goals in a reality which, which particularly Vedanta points out is ultimately beyond any goal. It is goalless, pathless. There is no path, there is no goal. And yet, for the sake of practice, for the sake of the effort that we have to make to awaken ourselves, the example that I gave last time, so that we are awake when the sun rises, even though we cannot do anything for the sun to rise, but still we have to do a lot to make ourselves fully awake when the sun rises. And that part of preparation for the experience, that has been very systematically presented by the, by the philosophy of yoga. So, levels which require effort, they are higher. Because you have to literally climb up into those levels of experience. A person has to make an effort, and the effort is there. We can speak of effortlessness as a deep inner experience which comes effortlessly, but the path of yoga is a path of tremendous effort. We see this on every level of yoga, whether it is the level of yama, whether it is the level of niyamas, whether it is the level of asana, whether it is the level of pranayama, it's a path of tremendous hard work. And anything that is achieved as a result of 
that hard work is considered high. Just figuratively, because similarly as if we are walking high up on a mountain. And planes of awareness, planes of consciousness, states of the heart, which come naturally to us out of ignorance, so to say, into which we fall figuratively because of ignorance, because of, because of a lack of awareness, they are figuratively pointed at as below, down. So this sort of gives us an understanding of what is meant by above and what is meant by below. below. Those levels, levels of violence, level, levels of selfishness, levels of greed, which come to us so naturally, we don't have to make an effort to reach those levels of consciousness. They are lower levels in that sense, because they are achieved, we fall into them very effortlessly. But the levels of noble virtues, the levels of selflessness, the level of nonviolence, the level of truthfulness, the level of universal compassion, the level of friendliness towards all, the level of uh, forgiveness towards all, all these levels that uh, the yogic masters speak of, a person has to make a conscious effort, has to make a resolution, has to resolve to achieve those levels, and that's why, in that sense, they are higher levels. That is, the sec that is the first way of looking at it. And then, usually, when it comes to above and below, something that is deeply involved is this downward pull of gravity. So the natural pull of the senses, which pull us away constantly from being centered within ourselves, within the heart. They pull away our awareness from there. So that is that, we can call it the outward pull, which the outward pull through the senses, which stops us from being centered. That is equal to the downward pull of gravity. So in the same way like uh, uh, in yoga, we evolve our practice. Just think how our practice, how our asana practice would be in the absence of the downward force of gravity. Because everything that we do, most of the postures, in a few postures we allow ourselves to go with the gravity. But in most of the postures, we have to work against it. Now just think if this downward pull of gravity won't be there, what kind of postures we would be practicing. And that's why it is very difficult to practice, to, it is very difficult to exercise when someone is in space where there is no gravity. You have to create a, a an artificial pull, an artificial gravity against which you can strengthen your muscles, you can exercise your muscles. So this downward pull, and it is the same thing on the path of yoga, whether it is asana practice. When through asana practice we work on being centered, on bringing our awareness back, first of all, into the physical body by focusing our attention on something within the body and not something out there. So bringing back our attention into the body, we are working against that outward pull of the senses by drawing back our attention into the body. So that too is another way of looking at high and below. So up and down, these are very relative terms and they have to be understood in a very specific sense. 
in the context of yoga. When in the context of yoga we say somebody has fallen down, for example, even Guruji, so humbly and so wisely when he used to do his practices in his old age and uh, who was it? It was uh, one of the BBC anchors or somebody? NDTV, yes. When they did an interview of Guruji and uh, uh, he was asked that why at this age you are a great celebrity and still at this age you are practicing with your students, why do you do that? So then he uses this word that I want them to see my downfall, you know, due to whatever the reasons, particularly due to age, you know. My downfall, which means the downfall of this physical body, which is inevitable. And being aware of that is part of the learning process an inevitable learning process to break one's identification with the body which was fundamentally presented in this mantra in the very first part of this mantra when uh, Sage Trishanku pointed out that I am not this tree but I am that energy, that power which animates this tree. What Guruji expressed was part of that learning process to make us aware and to make us aware that our asana practice shouldn't be, ev shouldn't be everything about the body but we should gain something deeper through that wonderful tool. Otherwise the body inevitably decreases in strength, in capacity. But awareness, consciousness, knowledge, understanding, that wisdom, that is what gradually increases. So when we use these expre expressions, downfall, lifting oneself up, for example, when in the Bhagavad Gita, Shri Krishna says that Uddhared Atman Atmanam Natmanam Avsadayit, lift up yourself through yourself. Don't allow yourself to fall down. In the chapter on yoga, in the sixth chapter, he very clearly uses this, this expression of not allowing oneself to fall down, but lifting up oneself through oneself. And yoga helps us to do that. Ultimately, it is not yoga, but it is we who lift ourselves through ourselves with the help of yoga because yoga gives us that strength to lift ourselves up but what does that upward lift mean again so this is what i have been trying to explain what i was trying to explain a little bit in my previous class and i continue to do this just additional thoughts that came to me today shared with you and in that sense urdhva pavitra when the master says that I am pure from above. He says that on those deeper levels of experience, I am at the source deep within myself, completely pure, and as I enter those depths within, then external impurities, impurities of the body, impurities of the mind content, impurities of my thoughts, all that doesn't affect me anymore because I have raised beyond it. And it is this awareness, this understanding which enables sage Trishanku to transcend his inner restlessness, his inner lack of peace. One of the stages that we were discussing. In this context of up and down, something else that uh, comes to my mind is that um, <clears throat> the Upanishads, the yogic texts, always speak of transforming the downward facing lotus into an upward facing lotus. This is a beautiful symbol that uh, 
has been pr presented again and again, I think even in Buddhist teachings, but it is certainly there in the Upanishads, in the Agama Tantra teachings, it is there in yoga. And uh, clearly in the Upanishads, it would be the most ancient uh, mentioning of this image, whether it is, st it is already there in further ancient parts of the Vedas, now I, I can't think, I would have to uh, look through everything. Most likely it is there, but I cannot, but about the Upanishads I'm completely sure. And let me first of all point out that uh, uh, the ancient Vedic symbol for the heart is the lotus. Today it is, how do you do it? Uh, like this? <laughs> like this. Eh? like this. That is, uh, that is the modern symbol of the heart. But uh, the Upanishadic symbol, the Vedic symbol of, uh, which, is, which, is, which is I think uh, universal at least when it comes to the Indian subcontinent. It is the same in Buddhism, it is the same in Jainism, it is the same in all the different traditions. The lotus is a symbol of the heart, the inner heart. And uh, usually if, if one looks also at the very physical anatomy, which is quite possible that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the ancient uh, Ayurvedic teachers must have looked at it, it looks very much like a downward dangling closed lotus, because it's triangular, a little bit like this, you know, and it's uh, the, the arteries come from up here. So it's, it's very much downward, dangling, closed lotus. So all these yogic teachers, they have evolved over that image. Particularly because for them, not the evolution of the brain, but the evolution of this region, which is where we feel. So for them, knowledge was not enough. That's why philosophy, this is a beautiful word because it means love for wisdom. But this was not for them the final pursuit. It was part of the journey. The final pursuit of, for them was darshana, direct experience, direct insight, direct realization, direct feeling of the truth. And at least when we look when we look within and we, when we try to feel within all the emotions that we feel, when we really feel them, we feel them in this region. And so what the masters, they develop on that image of a downward dangling lotus and say that uh, as long as it is closed, Usually, even if you look at the lotus plant, it is a little bit facing downwards, you know. But the moment the sun comes out, and this is the beautiful thing about the lotus plant, there are so many beautiful things about it. It is in the water, in the mud, and yet above it, untouched by it. You put a little bit of water into it, it just drizzles down. It doesn't become wet. So there are so many powerful symbolical ideas related to the lotus. And one of the most powerful ones is its deep contact, connection with light. The moment the sun rises, it opens. And then the sun sets, it closes. It has this, it, it faces the sun up, that source of life and light. And it is on this symbolical significance that this image has that the masters were working through yoga and that's why they brought, they made the lotus the symbol of the heart. The anatomical heart is very much like a downward facing closed lotus and that is how our feelings are, that is how our thoughts are, that is how our mind is, that is how our intellect is, that is how our ego and memories, all these inner faculties are. Their purpose was to change the direction. What was downward facing, let it 
face upward and let it open so that it can become receptive of that light. This was their purpose. And keeping this in mind, if you look now at Padmasana, the lotus posture, have you ever thought where the, the stem of the lotus in the lotus posture is? This is the stem. And that's why it is a dangling lotus. It is not a lotus from below and standing up, but it is more like and the source is up. And we are dangling down, downward facing. And Padmasana means to again change the direction of the lotus and make it again facing upward. So you have to be very careful when you apply the image of, of a lotus flower because this doesn't exist in nature. In nature, the stem is down and the source is below. But this is, the yogic masters make this very clear that the lotus that the yogis are concerned with is more like the flower of a banana, you know, which is downward dangling from above. So the lotus of the yogis, and this is not, I'm not saying that. The yogic masters give this example, Kadali Pushpavat, like the flower of, of this lotus is more like the flower of a, a, a banana tree, banana flower. It's, it's also very much like a lotus, and it's, it hangs down like this. Like a closed lotus, it hangs down, purple color. Yes, purple color. Lotus has many different colors, depending on, you have blue, you have... Yeah, this lotus is more, is, has the direction, is not, is not like the lotus that you find in the world out there, but it is more akin to the dangling banana flower. And closed, dangling downward, and the, it has to be opened and its direction has to be made upward. And Padmasana, if you look carefully now with this image in your mind, you fully understand. Otherwise, this much is, look very, looks very much like lotus. But what about this portion, the most important portion? What is that? That doesn't look like lotus. And what part of the lotus should this be? It's the stem. It's the nala. It's the nala, the stem. And very much the stem from here going to the, this, what do you call it, uh, Merudanda in Sanskrit, you know, the, the spine, yes, that is the stem. And this then becomes a down, uh, an upward facing opened lotus. And it is, now you can see why it is such a powerful image and why the masters, for so many reasons, for physical reasons, as well as for deeply spiritual, mystical reasons, they considered Padmasana to be the best posture for the sake of meditation. For this reason, and that's why we see the Buddha sitting in Padmasana, we see uh, the Jaina Tirthankaras, the Jaina 24 masters, most of them sitting in Padmasana, we see Lord Krishna, when he's in, in, in pictures in which he's sitting in meditation, he's sitting in Padmasana. Lord Rama, as a student of Yoga Vasishta, is shown as seated in Padmasana. That's why Padmasana has become such an important symbol, because physically also it gives us a very uh, straight, keep on forgetting this English word for spine. Yes, it gives us a very straight spine, and um, at the same time, it has a deeper, and I've just touched on a little bit of its significance. The more a person discovers its similarities and deeper meanings, that all depends on one's own practice. The more we practice, the more we are in those postures, we, we experience their benefits in our life, we, they start making sense to us on deeper levels. So <clears throat> this was 
in the context of uh, Urdhva Pavitraha, I think now we can proceed further to the next step. So the first step was Ahamriksha Saririva, in which he spoke about breaking his identification with the physical as well as the subtle body. The second step was breaking identification with the accumulated labels. When he says, Kirtihi Prashtam Giririva, that part of the mantra. The third step to find peace in this Urdhva Pavitraha, the way I explained it earlier in my previous classes, was about forgiveness, because only when one forgives oneself, he also can forgive others, and forgiveness is that third step to find peace within one's heart. Now comes the fourth step. Vajiniva uh, Swamrita Masmi, in which he expresses the awareness of oneness with the universe. He does not, of course, already when he breaks his identification with the accumulated labels, this is what naturally follows that, but he hasn't expressed it. Because ego is the only boundary, this limited sense of I, this limited sense of individuality, conditioned by this physical body and the thoughts arising within the physical body, that gives this sense of limited identity. But once a person has broken identification with that, then there is no wall to separate what lies within from that which lies. Uh, just today, I ordered a beautiful book and I forgot the title. Let me, it's, it's, it's a very interesting book and I hope to get it uh, in a few days. It, um, it is, uh, yeah, Living with the Stars, How the Human Body is Connected to the Life Cycles of the Earth, the Planets, and the Stars. So this, was, this, this is written by um, a medical scientist, someone who, who studies medicine, who studies the body, and uh, I'm very much looking at National Geographic Channel. The, the, the National Geographic magazine uh, printed an interview with the author of this, uh, this book. And that's how I come, came across this book. And uh, um, what he tries to do, I'm interested in book very much because uh, what he tries to do on a very physical level is what the Vedic masters have been trying to do since centuries on a deeper spiritual level, creating this awareness that we are very much an inseparable, deeply interconnected part of this universe. And that's why this break that we have created, this wall that we have created around ourselves, I versus this, you know, this wall is a very imaginary wall and in fact stands against everything that is in fact, logical, if a person meditates on this. So this, the next step that uh, Sage Trishanku is speaking about, in which he expresses his awakening to his oneness with the universe, very literally in his own words, oneness with the sun, the source of life and light, on this earth. This is another fundamental idea of the Upanishads, which is expressed by him and which is repeatedly expressed in the Upanishads when we were studying Ishavasya Upanishad. In fact, this famous mantra, Soham, which comes when we studied Ishavasya Upanishad, we came across this mantra. One of the most famous mantras taken for meditation, the masters going so far that this is one of those mantras that you don't even need to receive 
from someone who has practiced those practiced a mantra himself because usually what we say that a mantra becomes powerful with practice the more we practice it the more powerful it becomes and somebody who has added that power to the mantra when we receive that mantra from someone who has already practice that mantra for years and years together, we receive that mantra with all its power, which, with which the master has impregnated it. And that's why there is a lot of emphasis on receiving a mantra from a living teacher who has practiced it them, himself or herself. But Soham is one of those mantras that a person can practice without even receiving it from anyone else. That's why it is such a popular mantra that I am that, that is what I am. So it comes again in the context of uh, 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 one of such expressions where the seer experiences his oneness with the source of life and light present within the sun. This is a repeatedly reoccurring theme in the Upanishads which is equally true for the physical body. Today, we know that we are on a physical level literally made of stardust, which means that every atom present which, which forms, which has, takes the form of this physical body and everything around ourselves were created in the centers of the stars. And only when these stars, they blow out they blow out their matter into the universe and then again when it accumulates in the form of the earth and then eventually in the form of our body. And this book, the book that I mentioned, actually tries to show that how are not only on an atomic level we are created by uh, these particles which have their origin in the centers of the stars, but how we are deeply influenced on a regular level, on a daily basis, by the sun, on, on a very, very physical level. That is how deeply connected we are. I have not read the book yet, so I have no idea. But that is what, sorry? The author is, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, the author is, uh, where is the author? Uh, where is the author? I'd have to see online. No, sorry. Uh, yeah. Karel Shridjwar and Iris Shridjwar. This is the name. These two. They were both most likely husband and wife. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so now the next portion of this mantra. Vajiniva su amritam asmi. Su asmi means I am. Su means beautiful, shobhana. Amritam, I am the immortal. Amrita means immortal. Mrita means death. And Amrita means immortal. I am that beautiful, immortal essence, Vajiniva, which is the same as the essence which is present within Vajini, which means within the sun. The Sanskrit word Vajin, which means Vaja means movement, traveling. Therefore, Vajin means someone that moves constantly, travels constantly, and that is the sun. The sun never stops. It is constantly traveling and giving life and light, distributing life and light to the planet, constantly moving. And uh, the masters, they took the sun as uh, the primordial teacher. In fact, uh, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, in the beginning of the fourth chapter, Sri Krishna mentions that this idea of karma yoga, this idea of selfless action, this idea of working selflessly for the benefit of others, which is what karma yoga, Shri Krishna calls it karma yoga, Patanjali calls it Ishvara Pranidhana, which means surrendering, working in such a way as surrendering 
the results of our actions to the divine which is present within the heart of all beings. That is Patanjali's word for selfless work of service, karma yoga. Sri Krishna there, uh, in the fourth chapter, he says that vivaswan manave praha, Manu is the first human being in, in Indian mythology, uh, in fact, deeply related to the Sanskrit word for human, and even, in fact, uh, the English word man, you know, woman, that man. In Sanskrit, we call the first human being Manu. And it ultimately simply means the capacity to think, because it is the same root, Manas. So whoever that first human being was the one who had the capacity to think clearly. Who, before he acted, he or she, before they acted, they could think, they could analyze the results of those actions. That is what makes a human being a human being. A very grammatical definition of the Sanskrit word for manushya, human being, which means someone who thinks before he commits an act. And uh, yogis usually define barbarians as those who regret after committing something, after doing something. Bhute, who realize only after they have done it. Oh, this was a mistake. No, yeah. They are uncivilized yeah. barbarians. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who after they have committed a mistake, they realize. And a civilized human being is someone who has the capacity to think. Uh, standard definitions in yoga, I'm just talking about them. So, the first human being, Manu, whoever he or she was, the one who had the capacity to think clearly, they received this knowledge of karma yoga, this wisdom of karma yoga, this wisdom of selfless service, this inspiration to, to serve others selflessly by looking at the sun and how the sun selflessly serves this world by constantly radiating light and together with that life to us. So, and yet in return, it doesn't need anything from us. And it has been doing this from millions and millions of years. And that's why all that they did was striving to become like the sun. And they try to understand the sun on so many different levels. And in fact, every important idea of yoga, whether it is equality or any idea, they can be traced back to their meditations on the sun. But that's a different thing. Here, what Vajini, this Vaja, so he, he, clearly this tendency of the sun, this, this I shouldn't call it a tendency, but this nature of the sun to move constantly, to be constantly on move, to spread light, was what deeply inspired them. That's why in one of the hymns, uh, yeah, Charanvai Madhuvindati, it is only because of, because a honeybee travels from flower to flower that it accumulates honey. Charan Swadu Mudumbaram, it is only because a bird flies from tree to tree that it tastes the tasty sweet fruits. Then Suryasya Pashya Shemanam, look at the might, at the greatness of the sun, Yona Tandra which never is exhausted and constantly travels. That's why Charaiveti, 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 keep on traveling, keep on traveling, keep on traveling in search of knowledge, in search of external wealth as well as internal wealth. So both times, whether it is the external wealth of gold and all these things, for that also a person needs to travel and also for to acquire internal wealth, which is in the form of this wisdom, for that also a person has to travel, travel 
And most of us are such travelers. We have traveled from far away countries in search of knowledge, in search of wisdom. So we are already doing that. We are already following very naturally what the masters say. So this idea, this, I, this, this word that the master has used here, Vajiniva, like the traveling sun, the same essence which is in that traveling sun. The word Vaja also means energy, it means speed, it means splendor. So in that sense the word, I have just translated it as the sun, but it can also be translated as any source of light, whether it is the fire, whether it is lightning, or whether it is the sun. So it, I am, it can also be translated as, I am the beautiful, immortal essence, the same as the one present within the fire, within the lightning, and within the sun. The word vajin can also mean vaidika mantras. These are several, because Sanskrit, Sanskrit words have several meanings. So I'm just uh, going through the several meanings. The only me I can, I usually only give one meaning the most popular meaning, but that doesn't mean that uh, the mantra can only be understood in this way. There are several ways of understanding a mantra, and in each way it has a depth to it. Another way of explaining this mantra, because the word vajin also means mantras, so it can also be translated as that I am the beautiful, immortal essence the same as the one present within the mantras, within these teachings. The same essence which is being expressed in all the Vaidika mantras. In all the mantras, I am that beautiful, immortal essence. That is what I am. So like this, this section of the mantra can be explained, can be translated in different Ways. So, this was the fourth step in which, but as I said, the most important meaning is the one that uh, uh, changed the translation a little bit, uh, because uh, when I wrote this translation, I just did it a little bit in a hurry, and now as I'm going through more carefully uh, through each one of these mantras, so what, what is written here is, I am like the beautiful immortal essence present within the sun. I have now changed to I am the beautiful immortal essence which is the same as the one present within the sun. Mm -hmm. So this is how I have changed it. So next time we print, it out, we print these leaflets out, it will be updated. <coughs> That's why uh, in ancient India, masters didn't use books you know, because once you write something in a book, yes, the mantras will never change. The mantras, when it comes to the mantras, they will never change. But the understanding has to be constantly updated. Not only like this, but through our life experiences, as we grow further on our inward journey, on our journey to the center of the heart, our understanding of the mantras is constantly updated. And the mantras, they are just like seeds, simply. But the tree that comes out of that seed is every time unique. Which means that when a mantra is sown into my heart, the tree of realization that comes out as a result of sowing that seed of mantra is a unique tree. And when each one of us sows these mantras like a seed in their hearts, again the tree that will come out of those seeds, they will be unique. And that's why the tree that was, the tree of resultant knowledge that was there in the hearts of the commentators, they are very different from what is here today. And in that sense, uh, these, I, we call it talks, 
but I see it more as meditations because we are not try we are not studying the texts really, but we are really meditating on them. We're studying the texts, we wouldn't be now we have spent basically one hour today and one hour in the last session just on one word or two, three words. That's not study. If we would study like this, we will never ever finish. <laughs> you know? But the point is you can buy hundreds of books and study it. There's so many translations, so many commentaries. If you are interested, go and buy them. You can study it on your own. But what we are doing here is something unique. Because what we are doing here is Yes, it is, it is not, not, it is at the same time based in traditional wisdom because I have studied from the traditional masters for years and years together from them by sitting at their feet and I consult the most ancient commentaries on the text. So on one side, I am firmly and deeply rooted in the tradition and I'm not concocting something very non-traditional or something out of the blue, out of nowhere, my own philosophy. I'm not doing that. I'm deeply rooted in an established tradition of wisdom and yet at the same time as a unique person today in a unique era, in a unique time, I'm trying to find meaning in today's world so that we as practitioners and I myself by this journey I benefit tremendously my yoga practice benefits tremendously my life every day every day is different because of what the wisdom that I discover as part of my attempts of delving deep into these mantras and that is what I share and that's why they are more like meditations rather than talks but they are meditations they are active speaking meditations usually when we sit down we don't speak but in this case so that we all can join in I could be doing the same thing in silence here meditating on the mantra in silence the question is Will there be the same level of receptivity? You know, there is a beautiful statue of the ideal master in ashram, Dakshinamurti. Dakshinamurti is the ideal master. He doesn't speak. You know, Chitram Vatadarur Mule, the description goes that there is something strange happening under, under the tree of a uh, uh, fig tree. Vridha Shishya. All the uh, Students are very old and Guru Yuva and the master is a young child. Gurus to Maunam Vyakhyanam and the strangest thing is that all the discourses that the teacher is giving is in complete silence. And by listening to those discourses, all those old students, all their doubts have been removed. This is in fact the discourse that happens within, where this, the, the, the young child is that young child of self-awareness, which has been produced very recently, and that's why it is very young. And all our faculties, the mind, the intellect, the ego, our memories, they are all very old. They have become old. They are the students. They are the listeners. And the inner consciousness doesn't speak. It is just merely there. Its presence itself is its discourse. And that is what that statue, which is up there, Dakshinamurti, it is a beautiful uh, symbolical representation of the inner master. That is what it stands for. I don't think there is any other Dakshinamurti statue here in Rishikesh, uh, but uh, in... Yes, it is right in front of her. The temple dedicated to Dakshinamurti is right in front of her house. In, in her, yes, under the banyan tree. It is a beautiful symbol if a person understands it. So, we will come back to this meditation on the, Upan, on the Upanishad Shanti Mantras 
again in our next session. Still, if there are any questions or anything that you would like to contribute to this discussion, please feel free to do so. Thank you for giving us such a good meaning of being a traveler. In fact, uh, ancient India had these two types of travelers. One were called Charaka. Charaka. Patanjali's other name was Charaka. At least when we believe the traditions, his other name was Charaka. And Charaka means someone, that's why his work on Ayurveda is known as Charaka Samhita, the recension of Ayurveda by Charaka. And traditions believe that Charaka is just another name of sage Patanjali, simply because he traveled from place to place in search of knowledge. Such Charakas are also mentioned in the Upanishads as individuals who travel like a honey bee in search of honey from flower to flower in the same way they travel from place to place in search of knowledge, in search of wisdom. That is the first group. And the second group, which is uh, rather, it does, it, Parivrajakas are not mentioned. Uh, it's, it's a very ancient institution, certainly. Uh, but uh, uh, the word does not occur in, in the extremely ancient texts. But still, it is a very in, ancient idea, which means Parivrajaka, someone who travels to disseminate knowledge. So student traveler, teacher traveler. Charaka is the student traveler, and Parivrajakas are the, and they used to take this vow of not living in a place under a tree more than three nights. You know, and so they would just constantly travel. And they would be like traveling universities. So wherever they go, people come to them, and they share their insights with everybody. So this, uh, this institution particularly became very strong in the medieval times when most of the universities were systematically destroyed by the invasions and uh, there were no actual universities. Nalanda was destroyed, Takshashila was destroyed, all these great universities, Vikramashila, these great places of learning where thousands and thousands of students used to come from as far as Japan and as far as uh, uh, Greece in the West. And yet when these institutions were raised to the ground, still the institution of studying and teaching was very much kept alive by strengthening the institution of walking teachers, traveling teachers, the Parivrajakas. Uh, I think Nalanda Mahavihara was destroyed uh, by Alauddin Khilji in uh, 9th or 10th century. I'm very bad with dates, but that was approximately the time when it was used. All the, they say that uh, the books of the, of the university were used for 11 months to heat and cook food and heat the water by his army for 11 months, 11 months, yes. The army, a whole army, it could be an exaggeration, but still, still, it's quite a lot. You can see the, 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 the ruins are still there in, uh, in, in Bihar, the ruins of Nalanda are there. Just even if you look at the grain storage, you know, you can believe how much grain they had to store for the whole university. It's like a mountain. The, the, the part which is still standing, it's part of the grain store. And it's huge, huge. A lot of, most of, you see, most of the Buddhist script, scriptures, Buddhist Sanskrit, Sanskrit script, scriptures which were not taken to China, Tibet, to other countries, they all were completely destroyed. That's why we, in India, Buddhism ceased to exist after that. And so there were no continuous tran uh, transmission. On the other hand, when it comes to the Upanishads and Vedas, the oral transmission was there, very much there. 
and but still uh, still even uh, several of the great works of for example indian uh, sanskrit poetry and uh, um, uh, such as Swapna Vasavdattam, which is an ancient work, was only recently discovered because it was placed by someone in his field, buried in his field. Swapna Vasavdattam is found like, was found like this. We heard about this work in other books, but never found an actual copy. And then it was found buried uh, in a field. So like this, uh, different ways to preserve knowledge and wisdom. Yes, it was very, uh, the thing was that, uh, for example, uh, when Aurangzeb used to, used to say that, uh, uh, he, whenever he used to come across a scripture, he, he said, he used to ask, uh, what is in this scripture? Is it something against the Quran or is it in accordance to Quran? And if the answer would be in its, its According to the Quran, he would say, then read the Quran. You don't need to read this. Get rid of this book. And if you would say it's against the Quran, then he would say, then it's, 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 it's wrong. Because it's against the Quran, so you should burn it anyway. So that was, uh, there was a time when these tendencies existed. And uh, they affected the culture tremendously. So, but that's past. The present and the future is very bright. And beautiful. We have to focus on that and preserve and live because ultimately wisdom is preserved not through books, not through CDs, not through scanning old digital libraries and producing uh, CDs out of them, but by living that wisdom because that is when it becomes again and again meaningful, renewed. So we, our efforts should be directed towards living this wisdom in our life. That is the best way of preserving it. And that, when we preserve it in that way, then nothing can destroy it. My teachers, one of my teachers, Swami Veda, used to say that it doesn't matter. You burn all the Vedas, you burn all the yogic texts, you burn everything. As long as the practice of meditation lives, and which is something which a living person can teach to a living person, all these books, all these teachings will come into existence again. Because that is how they have come into existence, and that is how they will continue to come into existence. Burn away all the books, burn away everything, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the least. His words, he used to say this. Bhagavad Gita himself, in the fourth chapter, so there's so many different texts. The fourth chapter, Sri Krishna says that when, when people stop practicing, wisdom gets lost. That is why Krishna came back. He lived it, he practiced it, he relived it, and then he represented it. The same wisdom. Okay. Just two questions. That's that thing by the way, Gita, which is Gyana and Vidyana. Yes, the, this distinction between Jnana and Vidyana, when Sri Krishna, Jnanam, Vidyana, Sahitam. In, in, the understanding, in our understanding, we make this distinction between jhana and vijjana. Jhana is knowledge that you acquire by studying scriptures or by listening to the teachers. That is jhana. And experiential insight, experiential wisdom, which is based on one's own experience, that is called vijjana. That's what we should strive for, yes. From jhana, jhana is just a tool, just a tool. The knowledge that we receive by studying these teachings, by listening to the teachers, that is just an instrument. It's not the goal. The goal is to experience it. The goal is vijjana. And vijjana is now also the Sanskrit, the, the, the Sanskrit and Hindi word for science today. Because science is based on experience, is based on experiment. So they have used the same word, because Vidyana has that idea of knowledge which is based on experience. Okay. Yes? Every time after the class, I feel I like rediscovery the beauty of 
Beautiful. Yeah, I remember how you described it in there. Yes, please. A lot of time, a lot of things. Yeah. Before I think for granted. Yeah. But when I, uh, every time listen the philosophy of India, I realize, wow, we also have similar. Exactly. Why I didn't yes. know this profound meaning before. Before. Uh, it's like I'm begging with the diamond. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Begging with a, with a bowl made out of diamond. <laughs> exactly. That is, and I think everybody coming to yoga from any part of the world, for example, one of my uh, now friends, uh, uh, what is his name, Ekta? Dor. Dor. He's now, after coming here for several years, now he has developed an interest in Kabbalah. He's, Israel, he's Israeli, from Israel, so he's developed interest in Kabbalah. And now when he, when he from where did that interest came? He realized that the same thing is there also, you know? So then you go back into, into your roots, and this is my purpose, in fact. I cannot teach Kabbalah, I cannot do it. Because I, haven't, I don't know Hebrew, I, I have not been, I can only teach this, but my purpose of teaching this is to inspire my listeners to dig deep into their own sources. Whatever their source, and at the source, all the sources at the source are one and the same. That is the beautiful thing. It doesn't matter. So my point is not, I don't want that you go back with that, yes, uh, we were in India and I studied the Upanishads. No, I studied the Yoga Sutras, no. It should inspire my listeners to go back to their own culture and dig deep and find these eternal truths about themselves within their own cultures. That is how I envisage my ideal and purpose of doing these things. So, yes. Of the lotus, the lotus flower, yeah, yes. They also sing very high. Very high, uh, beautiful. Also the seeds of the lotus. Ah. So we think it's a ther therapeutic food. Therapeutic it, food. It can make you calm. Calm down and when completely. And people too much design, they can't sleep. And it's very good for uh, prepare food. Especially in the middle, uh, inside uh, it's like a sprout. Like, uh, okay. Very bitter. Very bitter. Uh, very, okay. And it's a medicine, kind of medicine okay. to calm down, to, to uh, destroy the fire of design, of too many, too excessive design. Desire, so okay. So make people calm and... Uh, beautiful, beautiful, uh, yeah. beautiful. We, we eat uh, the, the stem, actually. It's very expensive in India. You can pay up to 100 rupees per kg. But uh, sometimes they are a little bit cheaper. But that uh, white stem yeah. of the yeah. lotus, uh, and yeah, the seeds also we use. is yeah. makhana the seeds? Yeah. I don't know if it's makhana, but we use it sometimes here. That's makhana. Right. Yes, then it's that, then it's makhana. We call it makhana. Yes. 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 Pankaja, the Sanskrit word Pankaja, arriving from dust, dirt, and so yet. It's so good. Yes, 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 yes. The same idea exists here. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I, by the way, love the sound of Chinese language. I wait for the day when I can make that sound from my mouth and speak in Chinese. <laughs> Really, I'm saying this seriously. I'm considering it seriously to study Chinese language one day for sure. You speak it uh, from Malaysia? Uh, Indonesian, I do. Indonesian, I do. 
that's why after that, after perfecting that a little bit more, then I want next thing either Spanish or Chinese. It will be one of these two. <laughs> I have to choose. Still, Bahasa, Bahasa. I still still have to work a lot on it. Still not fluent, but yes, <laughs> could sort of uh, lead a conversation a little bit in it. <laughs> Every learning a new language is like taking a new birth into a new culture, into a new mentality. That's the beautiful. It's like a new birth. The, with every new language, you take a new birth. And you start to dif think differently. You start, somehow your vision of the world changes. And, uh, yeah. Chinese is certainly a very great language with the great culture underpinning it. Uh, really great. I also remind uh, two characters, Chinese characters, one is knowledge, one is wisdom. Mm -hmm. They are different characters. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is uh, uh, the true part, mm -hmm. the upper part is like uh, um, knowing. Knowing. Uh, the down part is like the song. Like the? Like Oh, sun. sun. Oh, okay. Like the, uh, knowledge is very obvious, like the sun. Like the sun. Nobody can neglect. Nobody can everybody neglect. Everybody can discuss, wow. can, can knowing, wow. uh, so it's knowledge. Wow. Uh, but wisdom is different. Wisdom is a uh, three, uh, three part. Yeah. Uh, the top part is the, uh, many, too many, means infinite. Infinite, yeah, okay. Uh, the middle is like a, like a U-turn. So like, I, like a U-turn. Ah, like a U-turn, okay. U and but it's a three, and it like, it's like this, and the middle is like a one, uh, one line. Okay. So I remember you talking about the uh, holy place, all these U-turns. With U-turn, yeah. To, yeah. Uh, U-turn inside, to yeah. find inside. Yeah. So it's uh, wisdom. That is uh, wisdom, and the, wow. And the, the three part, the lower part is heart. So the, the wisdom is different with knowledge. With knowledge. It's like a same. infinity. Yeah. Same. Yeah, in, infinity. Yeah. And also it's U10 and it's heart. So I, I, I realized, wow, how beauty our language. Yeah. But I don't know before. I don't it's amazing. Know. Every time she describes such these Chinese characters, I feel, you know, Sanskrit language, there is a lot hidden in a word. A word has so many meanings and it can be explained in so many different ways. It has a deeper significance. And it seems in Chinese language, it's yeah. with the letters. Yeah. The letters have so much in them, yeah, so you know, beautiful. like a container, like a container which contains yeah. so much information. You just have to dissect it. You have yeah. to open it and see, look at it. So much is hidden in it. Yeah. Because every language, every word, I found, oh, I didn't know that before. Yeah. It's like a, I never study elementary school. Yeah, yeah. I do. I'm now like a nursery school. Yeah, it's like that. That's how I feel every day whenever I approach <laughs> <laughs> these mantras and the meanings of these words. It feels like, oh my God, how little I know. How little I know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for reminding of that humbleness. Just uh, to remind of the ignorance that is there so much, so much. Thank you. So, 
should we conclude? Okay, should we finish? So we will finish uh, with the prayer. And as I said last time, and I've changed this now in the original file, which will be updated next time, the, the last shanti will be added, Vishwa shanti, Vishwa, world. Let there be peace to the whole world. So we will add the word Vishwa, as is common the custom with the last one, we will add that, okay? From now onwards. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschid Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shantihi Shantihi Vishwa Shantihi Thank you very much. Thank you.